if this kid's a wizard or shit so not. Number seven, the voice of silence. Gladness buoyed Atreyu's heart as he strode into the forest of columns which cast black shadows in the bright moonlight. In the deep silence that surrounded him, he barely heard his own footfalls. He no longer knew who he was or what his name was, how he had got there, or what he was looking for. He was full of wonder, but quite undismayed. The floor was made of mosaic tiles, showing strange ornamental designs or mysterious scenes and images. Atreyu passed over it, climbed broad steps, came to a vast terrace, descended another set of steps, and passed down a long avenue of stone columns. He examined them, one after another, and it gave him pleasure to see that each was decorated with different signs and symbols. Further and further he went from the no-key gate. At last, when he had gone heaven knows how far, he heard a hovering sound in the distance and stopped to listen. The sound came closer. It was a singing voice, but it seemed very, very sad almost like a sob at times. This lament passed over the columns like a breeze, then stopped in one place, rose and fell, came and went, and seemed to move in a wide circle around a trail. He stood still and waited. Little by little, the circle became smaller, and after a while, he was able to understand the words the voice was singing. Oh, nothing can happen more than once, but all things must happen one day. Over hill and dale, over wood and stream, my dying voice will blow away. Atreyu turned in the direction of the voice, which darted fitfully among the columns, but he could see no one. Who are you? he cried. The voice came back to him like an echo. Who are you? Atreyu pondered. Who am I? he murmured. I don't know. I have a feeling that I once knew. But does it matter? The singing voice answered. If questions you would ask of me, you must speak in poetry. For rhymeless talk that strikes my ear, I cannot hear, I cannot hear. Atreyu hadn't much practice in rhyming. This would be a difficult conversation, he thought, if the voice only understood poetry. He racked his brains for a while, then he came out with, I hope it isn't going too far, but could you tell me who you are? This time the voice answered at once, I hear you now, your words are clear, I understand as well as hear. And then, coming from a different direction, it's saying, I thank you, friend, for your good will. I'm glad that you have come to me. I am Yulala, the voice of silence, in the palace of deep mystery. Atreyu noticed that the voice rose and fell, but was never wholly silent. Even when it sang no words, or when he was speaking, a sound hovered in the air. For a time it seemed to stand still. Then it moved slowly away from him. He ran after it and asked, Oh, you Lala, tell me where you're hid. I cannot see you and so wish I did. Passing him by, the voice breathed into his ear. Never has anyone seen me. Never do I appear. You will never see me and yet I am here. Then you're invisible? He asked. But when no answer came, he remembered that he had to speak in rhyme and asked, Have you no body? Is that what you mean? Or is it only that you can't be seen? He heard a soft bell-like sound, which might have been a laugh or a sob, and the voice sang, Yes and no and neither one, I do not appear in the brightness of the sun, as you appear, for my body is but sound, but one can hear but never see, and this voice you're hearing now is all there is of me. In amazement, Atreyu followed the sound this way and that way through the forest of columns. It took him some time to get a new question ready. Do I understand you right? Your body is this melody? But what if you should cease to sing? Would you cease to be? The answer came to him from very near. Once my song is ended, what comes to others soon or late? When their bodies pass away, will also be my fate. My life will last the time of my song, but that will not be long. Now it seemed
became certain that the voice was sobbing, and Atreyu, who could not understand why, hastened to ask, Why are you so sad? Why are you crying? You sound so young. Why speak of dying? And the voice came back like an echo. I am only a song of lament. The wind will blow me away. But tell me now why you were sent. What have you come to say? The voice died away among the columns, and Atreyu turned in all directions, trying to pick it up again. For a little while, he heard nothing. Then, starting in the distance, the voice came quickly closer. It sounded almost impatient. Eulala is answer, answers on questions feed. So ask me what you've come to ask, for questions are her need. Atreyu cried out, Then help me, Eulala, tell me why. You sing a plaint as if you soon must die. And the voice sang, the childlike empress is sick and with her fantasia will die. The nothing will swallow this place. It will perish and so will I. We shall vanish into the nowhere and never as though we had never been. The empress needs a new name to make her well again. Atreyu pleaded. Oh, tell me, Ulalo, tell me who can give the childlike empress the name which alone will let her live. The voice replied. Listen and listen well to the truth I have to tell. Though your spirit may be blind to the sense of what I say, print my words upon your mind before you go away. Later you may dredge them up from the depths of memory, raise them to the light of day, exactly as they flow from me. Everything depends on whether you remember faithfully. For a time he heard only a plaintive sound without words. Then suddenly the voice came from right next to him as though someone were whispering into his ear. Who can give the childlike empress the new name that will make her well? Not you, not I, no elf, no djinn can save us from the evil spell. For we are figures in a book, we do what we were invented for. But we can fashion nothing new and cannot change from what we are. But here's a realm outside Fantasia, the outer world is its name. The people who live there are rich indeed, and not at all the same. Born of the word, the children of man, or humans as they're sometimes called, have had the gift of giving names ever since our worlds began. In every age it's they who gave the childlike empress life, for wondrous new names have the power to save. But now for many and many a day, no human has visited Fantasia, for they no longer know the way. They have forgotten how real we are. They don't believe in us anymore. Oh, if only one child of man would come. Oh, then at last the thing would be done. If only one would hear our plea. For them it is near, but for us too far. Never can we go out to them. For theirs is the world of reality. But tell me, my hero, you're so young. Will you remember what I have sung? Oh, yes, cried Atreyu in his bewilderment. He was determined to imprint every word on his memory, though he had forgotten what for. He merely had a feeling that it was very, very important, but the sing-song voice and the effort of hearing and speaking in rhymes made him sleepy. He murmured, I will remember, I will remember every word, but tell me, what shall I do with what I've heard? And the voice answered, that is for you alone to decide. I've told you what was in my heart. So this is when our ways divide, when you and I must part. Almost half asleep, Atreyu asked. But if you go away, where will you stay? Again, he heard the sobbing in the voice, which receded more and more as it sang. The nothing has come near. The oracle is dying. No one again will hear you la la laughing, sighing. You are the last to hear my voice among the columns, sounding far and near. Perhaps you will accomplish what no one else has done. But to succeed, young hero, remember what I have sung. And then, further and further in the distance, Atreyu heard the words, Oh, nothing can 
things must happen one day. Over hill and dale, over wood and stream, my dying voice will blow away. That was the last Atreyu heard. He sat down, propped his back against a column, looked up at the night sky, and tried to understand what he had heard. Silence settled around him like a soft, warm cloak, and he fell asleep. When he awoke in the cold dawn, he was lying on his back, looking up at the sky. The last stars paled. Eulala's voice still sounded in his thoughts. And then suddenly he remembered everything that had gone before and the purpose of his great quest. At last he knew what was to be done. Only a human, a child of man, someone from the world beyond the borders of Fantasia, could give the childlike empress a new name. He would just have to find a human and bring him to her. Briskly, he sat up. Ah, thought Bastion, how gladly I would help her. Her and Atreyu, too. What a beautiful name I would think up. If I only knew how to reach Atreyu, I'd go this minute. Wouldn't he be amazed if I were suddenly standing before him? But it's impossible. Or is it? And then he said under his breath, if there's any way of getting to you in Fantasia, tell me, Atreyu. I'll come without fail. You'll see. When Atreyu looked around, he saw that the forest of columns with its stairways and terraces had vanished. Whichever way he looked, there was only the empty plain that he had seen behind each of the three gates before going through. But now the gates were gone, all three of them. He stood up and again looked in all directions. It was then that he discovered in the middle of the plain a patch of nothing like those he had seen in Howling Forest. But this time it was much nearer. He turned around and ran the other way as fast as he could. He had been running for some time when he saw, far in the distance, a rise in the ground and thought it might be the stony, rust-red mountains where the great riddle gate was. He started toward it, but he had a long way to go before he was close enough to make out any details. Then he began to have doubts. The landscape looked about right, but there was no gate to be seen, and the stones were not red, but dull gray. Then, when he had gone much further, he saw two great stone pillars with a space between them. The lower part of the gate, he thought, but there was no arch above it. What had happened? Hours later, he reached the spot and discovered the answer. The great stone arch had collapsed and the sphinxes were gone. Atreyu threaded his way through the ruins, then climbed to the, to the top of a stone pyramid and looked out, trying to locate the place where he had left the Nomix and the Luck Dragon. Or had they fled from the nothing in the meantime? At last, he saw a tiny flag moving this way and that behind the balustrade of Engelbuk's observatory. Atreyu waved both arms, cupped his hands around his mouth, and shouted, Ho! Oh, are you still there? The sound of his voice had hardly died away when a pearly white luck dragon rose from the hollow where the gnomes had their cave and flew through the air with lazy, sinuous movements. He must have been feeling playful, for now and then he turned over on his back and looped the loop so fast that he looked like a burst of white flame. And then he landed not far from the pyramid where Atreyu was standing. When he propped himself on his forepaws, he was so high above Atreyu that to bring his head close to him, he had to bend his long, supple neck sharply downward. Rolling his ruby-red eyeballs for joy, stretching his tongue far out of his wide-open gullet, he boomed in his bronze bell voice, Atreyu, my friend and master, so you finally come back. I'm so glad. We had almost given up hope. The gnomes, that is, not I. I'm glad too, said Atreyu.